The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees. I'm Jonathan Beyer. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. So, obviously, uh, we wanted to record something about Dennis Ten. Uh, you know, I think everyone knows the news by now that on Thursday morning, uh, in here, uh, Thursday midday in Kazakhstan, that Dennis was uh, stabbed to death tragically, unexpectedly, uh, senselessly. I, I don't know. Uh, what to say? I there was his funeral was just happening, or it's it's all. Um, Which I have to say, I mean, obviously when I read that information, it was so shocking. But then I was surprised that the funeral has already happened. Yeah, or they had like public mourning and all this sort of stuff. That, and I forget, like in places like Kazakhstan, how big some of these skaters are, mm -hmm. uh, because he kind of really did have like a big political presence, a big. You know, just a regular personality presence in in Kazakhstan. So it was it was pretty touching to see all of the the public support that that came out for him already. Yeah, it was interesting. I was uh, in New York on Thursday and I saw Scott Dyer, who trained with him with Frank, obviously, and he was saying that Dennis had like after Dennis won the medal at the Olympics, like. He was staying in a penthouse in Marina del Rey that the Kazakhstan Federation had gotten for him. And then you realize, like, Dennis can only be here, like, so many months out of the year because of, like, green card situations, or visa situations, not green card situations, sorry. And, uh, you know, that's why, like, sometimes he'd be with Lori, or he would be with um, Frank, or sometimes, you know, all different stuff. And you, you, it's just so interesting... Uh, when you start to watch his history and watching some of the uh, films on him and reading the articles, like he really um, was a very international skater in a way. He kind of had a, he was part Russian, part Korean, part Kazakh, I mean, which is, that's the country. I, I mean, David, did, uh, maybe I'm just ignorant mm -hmm. um, because I felt like there was not as much talk about his Korean descent that I knew about early in the career. Mm -hmm. um, and then going back and rewatching kind of all these videos and documentaries and special, he talked about it so much more in recent history, and I did not know about the lineage about the Korean um, general, or I'm misspeaking. Um, was it a great grandfather, I think, who like yeah, was a general. fought for independence in Korea and all these sorts of things? And it was like really interesting. And then for him to have come up with like Elena Buyanova and like this kind of whole like Russian thing going on, but yet there was so much um, North American appeal with a lot of that like Frank and Maury finishing touch kind of thing. So I think it was kind of hard to find anyone who didn't respond to his skating in some way, right? Yeah. Where so many other skaters are so polarizing um, in where geographically they their skating is enjoyed the most. Yeah, I think it, um, as far as that with the, I think it just so, so interesting that, you know, the Olympics were in Vancouver where... You could say, well, he, you know, later worked with Laurie Nickel, but uh, in Canada, I think what's interesting about the Olympics were in Sochi, and obviously he trained in Russia with Elena Buyanova and Tarasova for years um, when he was a kid, and then the Olympics were then in Korea. So I'm sure before Sochi, if we looked at the articles, it would all be about his Russian connection, and then yeah, if we look, literally, you can pick out anything that's applicable because he was so. <laughs> that's what Jenny the board. always said about the skating media is that if she, they'd either pick up on the fact that she did ballet as a kid or right. that she had um, a mother who passed away. And they kind of, like, get certain factoids and just... Right. Apply the most at the time. Yeah. yeah. So I think, and I think a lot of um, Dennis's story, and I was talking um, to Frank's assistant, and she was saying that part of, like, a lot happened in his, you know, he was always kind of a mystery, mysterious skater, and they didn't know, like, when he was going to be in town or not. Because of like political unrest, even between Kazakhstan and Russia, and some sort of deal with the oil and stuff, is like why he even switched coaches at certain points. And there's all, uh, you know, political unrest. He didn't think it was safe for him to go back there at one point because he was in a minority or some point. I mean, he's also there was stuff about him being in a political party in Kazakhstan. I think there's all sorts of different. Um, Things well, going on there, yeah. It's, remember the second mark or whatever when you read when they were putting all three stories side by side, and we hear about the North American, you know, Jamie and David, and they're just kind of kids that kind of skated and all this sort of stuff. And then you hear some of these other backstories, and you're like, the fact that you were dealing with all of that on top of competition nerds and on top of such a demanding sport to then also 
I don't think there was ever a competition or a training period. Well, one, where there wasn't some sort of injury or physical thing around, but also where there wasn't a drama that involved visas and government uh, conflict and all this sort of stuff. Like, it's just such another element that he would have to have been dealing with that entire time. Right? I'm thinking about him a lot, and it's so interesting because his career kind of um, rose. Like, when we started doing recaps of competitions is right when Dennis... The first one we ever really did was for Continents, and it was just messy. <laughs> Our cameras were different heights. But Dennis that had like a really uneven competition there, and I remember thinking like, oh, this kid is really talented. And then it was The World, of course, was the first um, recap, and that's where yeah. many people felt that Dennis deserved to win, and that's when Chanflation really hit such a peak moment, uh, and then, you know, the world media was really starting to pay attention to skating again before the Olympics, and so many people felt that Dennis deserved to uh, to win there, and then we talked to Frank about it, and then it's interesting how, but there was something where his father was sick, and it sounded like, I have some vague story of Dennis Ten, and perhaps um, someone who watches will remember, because we are seeing uh, photos of Almaty, you know, for the first time, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly, uh, but something he was carrying his father on his back in the mountains at some point in time before the Olympics, and also, do you remember that Dennis had a sprained ankle? that yeah. he trained on and somehow it became infected and the infected and he lost a tooth and then like competed at a senior B weeks later. And that so there's a lot going on. Uh, right. Yeah. It was always a, um, but the, the interesting thing is the um, skeptic side of me, the skeptical side of me when he was competing, you know, he was known for inconsistencies and all this sort of stuff. But I really find um, Frank to be a no excuses kind of guy. Right, but he was always very empathetic about Dennis. Frank always had, has always had a soft spot for Dennis, even when um, when we filmed with there with Gracie uh, and Carly, we didn't think Dennis was going to be there, and then he was. And I don't think Dennis was really happy that we were going to be there because he was in like no competition. Yeah, ready to be seen. Yeah. Okay. So that just kind of showed about how up and down his training was. I mean. I remember that day he was testing out some new program and I was trying, it was some, something experimental that I don't remember if he ever competed it, but it, um, I d didn't think it was the best choice. Um, <laughs> but it was but so interesting. Floor. Right. Yeah. And it's I just remember him popping triple axel after triple axel into singles. And you could just see like, here's someone who's almost like a warrior about like getting himself into shape, but the training is like erratic right. because of the injuries and because of everything else going on. And then, yeah. I, it, there was so much about him, and, I mean, in addition to where he's from. I mean, the, we really got to see more about him as a cultural presence when they were trying to get Almaty, or however it is properly pronounced, to host the Olympic Games. And, and he really started, like, you know, kind of being more of a public figure there as we saw it. But his whole training situation was always so mysterious. Mm -hmm. Or how he would arrive at a competition or which which one you got. But man, when those stars aligned, because it was kind of like Mao in the later seasons where the programs were of such quality and such detail that it transcended um, a technical struggle, I found. I was still able to enjoy it, but... Um, I am thankful for those performances when everything did line up because when they happened, they were so magical, even if there were a couple of errors. Um, but he was one of those that was like, I was always so afraid to become all the way invested in him mm -hmm. if I wanted to because the um, being too fanatical about him, I was like, you know, like even, even those like years with Jeremy would be like, ah, <laughs> you know, he was you know. always one of our secret favorites, you know, like even Not for yeah. secret though, I think, right? Because because the the base material he was always to come up with for me, especially when he was with Lori, um, it was it was pretty pretty cool the stuff they were able to come up with, and they seemed to have um, a good rapport with one another. Yeah. Yeah. Her work looked good on him, and he looked good doing her work, you know? So, yeah, I, I like Phil it. Hirsch is always uh, hosting about the artist, and I, I, to me, that's, I don't think that that's his best program. Uh, I really liked when he did the Shostakovich uh, 
the who, the lady and the hooligan uh, program that he did the Olympics, and then obviously the next season with um, the Caruso, and then the free skate that you were in love with, and then I like grew to love it throughout the year because I remember. And I forget because it it really landed for him that worlds. The four but continents course, and the worlds. Remember the four continents? He won and he laid on the ice and then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the thing that I was so flustered by at worlds was they went down to his feet right in time to start that amazing segment where his arms were so exquisite. So the, the world feet, unfortunately, from that year missed to me the coolest part of the program. Yeah. But he did some cool cantilevery things. Like every single move in there was so um, original. And not for originality's sake. It always served the music. It always served the emotional wave. You know, it was, yeah, it was kind of next level stuff. And I know, you know, he's saying in choirs, like like many people um, who are such great artists on the ice have a musical background. He's, he's one of them. And then they even said he, like, competed in the choir games. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> what is this? The choir games. <laughs> Jonathan, if, if anything ever happens to me, be sure to be say like I took piano lessons when I was a kid, and that you really felt that sensitivity. I with... think flying free, yes, the musical yes. sentimentality is for sure. Yes, so. oh, flying free. Yes. Um, number. <laughs> uh, the other thing um, it was interesting because they yeah they showed a piano in the uh, the Olympic uh, the IOC piece on him, uh -huh. which is so funny. The so the IOC piece was filmed when he was training with Nikolai for. I think he was there for maybe a year, 14 months. But they right. have, like, shots of Nikolai, like, staring at him on the bleachers at uh, the rink in Hackensack. And they're talking about Frank, but they're, like, looking at Nikolai. And then he's, like, running through the streets in Hackensack in, like, a kind of rocky homage. Well, actually, I thought that kind of footage of him when he was talking about, like, I'm the only one that's accountable for me. I don't know. I kind of thought it was actually, like, a really nice moment in that yeah. special that he did. Yeah. <laughs> And then they make Hackensack and the Hudson River look beautiful. Which, if you've ever um, been there, you're like, how did they make it look so, so stunning? Like, so uh, look at that. He was in like floor to ceiling, like window area. It looked like he was in like a high rise in Miami or something. You know, there are that. some really nice buildings in Hackensack, but it's just, it's just kind of one of those old cities that's been changing and still not changed yet you know so i mean i work in newark so there's like transitional. it's transitional <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny i um i drive through harrison on my way to work and uh it's one of those places where they're putting a ton of money in it and hoping that amazon's coming and other businesses are bringing in and like there are still elements of it that are like when my grandparents were uh you know like <laughs> emigrated <laughs> you know and it, you're like exactly <laughs> Just around the corner. Well, the other thing they show um, <clears throat> in, in that particular fluff piece segment, whatever you want to call it, was when he was trying on um, the costume with those huge, like, silvery mirrors on the collar and things. Yeah, I was like... It kind of looked yeah. good on him there. When you saw it up close, I was like, oh, I see why they thought that kind of is a thing. I remember first seeing it in competition being like, whoa, it looks like Gaudi, not gaudy, but well, kind of, but Gaudi, that, that mosaic guy from Spain that like did all the architecture with like the random mirrors and things. Um, but he, he always just, you knew you were in for something at the start of every season. Mm -hmm. And I may not have like loved each thing equally, but you always knew they were going to go for something. They were going to try something. And even when, um, kind of jumped the shark a little bit, in my opinion, artistically, when he went over to um, Nikolai and things like that. But even still, it was like kind of fun to see like Genesis take on that school. Even the year before, remember at Worlds in Boston, uh, he did like, was it the Nutcracker, Romeo and Juliet? Romeo and Juliet, I think. And Romeo But it was like a weird edit. And But uh, I think that was really about him trying to get in another quad. They tried to just... Put a program around, and that was the year that he started with that other music, and then they switched it and right. switched what he was doing. And I remember he had some bizarre falls on like sow cow entrances, and it was like weird things going on because he was trying to add another quad into you know his repertoire. But talking to Scott, he said that he felt like at a certain point after Dennis won four continents and won um, you know another medal at Worlds and medal at the Olympics that it, he was getting really into the I guess the shows and the productions that he was 
doing in Kazakhstan. And then I guess he worked with Benoit, uh, Benoit, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm sorry, I've never met him. Um, the choreographer who works with um, uh, Is it Benoit? Is it B-E-N-O-I-T? Benoit? Yeah, Benoit, yeah. Benoit. Yeah. Benoit. Uh, that he was... Um, I like the Ben Pauls, right? Like the... Um, Did you see that the, they were like working in a black and white thing on Instagram and Dennis was, um, was right. like, dancing on the stage with him and maybe that was for his show? I'm not sure. Yeah. And some of the people um, on Instagram or wherever who post pictures of them dancing on the floor. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it... I'm not talking about dancing on the stars kind of, or, you know, dancing with the stars kind of stuff, but... Um, it's he moved beautifully. Yeah. For so it was interesting because that music, or it was a musical background, not necessarily that ballet background you might have also expected from him. But he he <clears throat> even just on a regular dance floor moved so well yeah. and so honestly and so vulnerably. Like that's why I kind of when you said you went to the rink when you were filming Gracie and Carly, mm -hmm. is there any shrines on? They may have come nowhere. But it seemed like the student that was always up for trying a new kind of program. I would think a choreographic dream. Like someone could say, and each thing was so different. It wasn't variations on a theme like a lot of other great, you know, artistic skaters. The artist was totally different from the Asian program. was totally different than Caruso. was totally different than, you know, the Olympics. Like all of this sort of stuff. It was just, it was always authentically him, but it was a completely, totally different approach all the time. So I was never bored when he was going to get on the ice. His was a jumping technique. I, did, I aesthetically didn't always understand um, when things went wrong or what kind of things were going to go wrong. You know, like with some skaters, you're like, well, watch for this. Or they'll inevitably blah, blah, blah. Or you know to look for someone's arms or look for someone's takeoff. But him, it was just kind of always a mixed bag. And I didn't really know technically... I never, it never really jived to my aesthetic what the plan was and if it went awry, how so, you know? I think watching him, I think what was so interesting about his technique, especially when you know skating and then not just artistically, but technically, because he worked with Tarasova and Guyanova, he has a lot of very Russian elements to his skating. Um, when he enters the quad, it looks like Yagudin and he's standing straight up with a perfectly straight back and a certain posture. Uh, when he goes into it, which is very reminiscent of that school. And then he has kind of like the knee bend of that Frank added, you know, to adds and the cleanliness there. And then he would also work with Raphael. So he has some of that on the axle going on. And then there's... The axles, when those worked, they were really like, I don't know, there was space Straight up and down. And, and, yeah. Yeah. They were really like kind of a classic looking style. I kind of liked it when it worked. And I remember artistically, because he worked with Lori, and he worked sort of working with Lori right after Patrick started moving away from Lori, but there would be clusters to his footwork that you would see that Lori had started to develop with Patrick, and then I think, you know, Dennis took to the next level and stuff like that. So yeah, was, she, like, like, she had these ideas, but she needed the right student to execute it. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of, it's, it's her Pomchenko twist. <laughs> She's been waiting all these years. But then literally it's that footwork in the 2014-15 long program. Uh, and even the clustered footwork of earlier, there are just some like moments that you have to kind of go back and rewatch it a couple times and from a couple different camera angles in order to appreciate the complexity and the depth of the sophistication in their movement. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I think I was reading that he's wrote a script for a film and we knew that he was into photography and he was into long Instagram posts that we never really knew what they were really about. Um, but I think there's a lot, I think, coming. It would be a really interesting documentary on him if someone, if the IOC put that together or... A lot, his English, like in the Olympic video and things like that, is so exquisite. And a lot of times on social media, and this time, uh, sometimes happens with Misha as well, um, I feel like I, understandably so, am missing an element given the translation factor. I was like, I can't, I feel like the only people who maybe really get a true sense are those who know you in your native tongue. Because sometimes, like, the post would seem like they meant something, and then I, 
I struggled sometimes to figure out what exactly the message or tone was to convey. But of course, we know Dennis is um, a favorite among the skaters because, of course, he made the cut for Yuri on Ice to have a yes. <laughs> his spinoff character that he wrote a whole blurb about. But again, I couldn't tell if he was being cheeky about it or if he was being a little um, huffy about it. He, he had a mix. He had a mix. Again, it was hard to read the tone um, with the language barrier, but I, I think he was saying that he was a little, like, eye rolly about that his likeness had been used. Well, okay, because that comes from another Dennis memory. Um, so one time I was in an elevator with Dennis in Boston, and I remember, like, we were in the elevator, and I forget who I was with, but we were like, you know, said, oh, like, I hope you do well in the competition, you know, and just going to our rooms, and one of those weird you know, brief interactions and being like, oh, that was a little strange. And then getting coffee like 15 minutes later and the news comes over that something had happened with him and Hanyu at practice. And obviously Hanyu was, you know, a lot of the bases of Yuri and Ice. And yeah. I remember, and we're going to have to like, I remember the details of this were so, someone thought that someone got in his way purposely during an ice session, which is like people get in each other's way all the time. But Especially then, two pros like, like yeah. Dennis and, and but remember, Hanyu. it became like a weird international incident that the media glommed onto. And obviously at that point was when Hanyu was setting so many world records. And but I, I remember thought that it, like it was fan fuel. Like a couple of super fuel. Hanyu fanatics or something got things real riled up there. And, but I mean, I think that they will say that that was the media and that was someone else. And, but I think that that has something to do with why Dennis was in Yuri on Ice and why the eye rolly. Oh, okay. And that would make him like the moody villain or something. And, yeah, because they, they, they painted him in Yuri on Ice. It's just like, because wasn't that the motorcycle character? Like some like very like esoteric and distantly mysterious. You like, remember Yuri on Ice way better than I do. What I remember from Yuri on Ice is that there was like a weird student um, coach relationship that would now be considered inappropriate. Um, as opposed well, to safe school. It's inappropriate when we watched it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there were pork bowls, and yeah. um, it was always about the Grand Prix final because that's the event that Hanyu wins all the time. And right. it was um, they they just announced they're coming back for another season, or they're doing a film, or is it something like this? first? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I want to see it. I would look. The, it was always um, interesting choreographically how they were kind of dead on with some things, and then some things. The, the, the blanket character types. Like the over sexualized Swiss skater yes. was like a whole, like, oh my gosh. And some of the things that they would have the skaters say, I mean, again, I know we did a whole spiel about it like a year and a half ago, whenever that was. But for those who haven't seen it, to go back and watch the actual footage of the competition. <laughs> So I think the weird thing about Yuri and Ice is that it was super big in the anime community, and I'm not sure why it glammed on because I'm not uh, I mean I've seen Spirited Away but I'm not like a super big uh, anime person um, I also saw but it was so accurate I'm sorry. well yeah no it was so accurate to the scene but it was very popular also in the anime world and that was and I, I'm not sure why it, it caught on in particular or what the reference point was so it was the cross section of skating and Japan and anime and it just became Great. Like Dennis Ten skating, it was a hit. You know, it was the right amount of Tarasova <laughs> and Frank and Lori. Yeah, and just, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, uh, um, but just, just so. I mean, and just what, I rewatched your program a lot with the. That's right. Kid. Yeah. With the, this, the side, the that whole thing, it was so so cool, and the music selections were were usually very elevated. And, like that and you know when you have David Wilson on this a couple of your interviews left, like definitely left lasting impressions the first one being that Frank one when you interviewed him right after Dennis was second and in my opinion should have won that world championships um, but the other one was with David Wilson when he was talking about Kim Yuna so here you are what do you do with this this fame this name this recognition what do you do and she's done so many things um in a public way, but Dennis is doing so many things, not only in a public way, like maybe writing a film or whatever um, appearances he was doing, but he was really instrumental in bringing more skating 
to Kazakhstan, the Olympic tours that he was doing, the shows he would invite everybody to do. Um, it was very noble that his legacy isn't just in competition or just in some endorsement, but also in actually cultivating skating in Kazakhstan. Whether that turns into other real competitors or not, I don't even know that that matters. Uh, they were talking about the influx of like outdoor uh, rinks and you know just recognition of skating in general. And, that outdoor uh, rink looked gorgeous. Like, didn't you want to go there and skate? Like, I, I wanted to go. It was in the mountains and it was sunny. I'm sure it's freezing cold, but I mean, it looked yeah. gorgeous. It looked like it was a ski resort. I'm ready. And even then, they had the university out there, which had you know some nice facilities and things. You know, and that's all Dennis. I think with no Dennis, that would have never have happened. I think. And in rewatching his programs, also, it's one of those things he draws the audience to him. He doesn't hit us with it like so many other skaters. He's kind of skating for himself, but yet we kind of all lean in to watch it. That's what I really like. It's so interesting that Russia didn't try to have him compete for them because usually with the former republics, like Voloshajar, all of a sudden is Russian or, you know, someone else. That would be an interesting story, too. It would be interesting to do a documentary film with him and interview the people that kind of were in that skating troupe, like Savchenko or, you know, a lot of the Russian, you know. Uh, and what the behind the scenes also is, like, we knew they moved from Kazakhstan to Moscow, now Moscow to California, California now to Morova. And it would be interesting to hear um, what were the motivate. the big one is what was the motiv motivating factor in going to California, yeah. I think. And, and hearing more than just, like, a generic Wikipedia entry or like kind of a fluff ice article or ice network esque kind of article um, that was just like and then it was ready for a change you know and, and it's so weird with ice network because there were so many problems with it but then when something like this happens you're like Wait, where is ice network where is yeah, the rutherford know-how articles yeah and phil kept going on about he loves like i feel like sometimes Phil feels like a relative to me. I don't know about you, but like Phil and Christine feel like members of the family that we have at Thanksgiving. Yeah, we literally grew up with, like yes. in the skating world. Yeah. Who we know, you know, and, and things. And you're like, and Phil is always talking about the artist because like he must have been at 2013 Worlds and that must be why he saw it and glummed on. But I'm like, Phil, you're in our musical person. Like why wasn't 2015 bigger than you? And then he also is like, I had never seen a skater do the short program and then continue it in the long program before and you think Phil you were at the 94 Olympics I know you were because of Tanya Harding Philippe Candelero did the Godfather in both parts yeah. I mean where were you for that Phil but exactly <laughs> and again it's not that you can even isolate a program of Dennis's because I like the artist for what it was it's a, a nice time and really that was an arrival season in many ways for him so it, it served as the right vehicle, but like in general, to me, it was the death. It was that he came back like really those three seasons in a row with some pretty stellar artistic work that was so varied. That was so much more impressive to me. And Frank would say it was the posture of the camel spin, you know, or different, yeah. It was. It's, uh, I mean, and when he did land those squad triple like combos, even quasi recently, like it just looked easy as pie when it worked. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's horrible. Horrible that that happened. Yeah, and I feel like it's one of those things where we will never know the full story or what was going I on. Or what, it, what kind of random, what was the motivation and what was, I don't, I don't think that car mirrors were the motivation, but there's so many potential, like, things that have absolutely nothing to do with Dennis that this, you know, could be, you know, so I don't know that we'll ever know, you know, unfortunately. So... Um, yeah, just horrible. Um, a big loss, a big loss. So, um, but I think, um, yeah, a lot going on in the skating. Uh, Seguin and Bilodeau, uh, split this week, which was really surprising because we knew that they were getting new programs and Megan Duhamel had been working with them and they had been working hard. And talk to you about working with them. Yeah. Um, I knew <laughs> This news came out the same day that Dennis died, I believe, correct? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, understandably so, but I think that this kind of whole story, um, as a show, I mean, obviously the Dennis story is much more prominent, but I think that a lot of people don't realize that this has actually happened because it kind of 
miss a lot of people's radar. Um, and I know they, they were other ones that always, there was a mystery about the health and a mystery about certain withdrawals and things like that. So you knew maybe there were some rocky things for them. So I actually, when I first read the headline, didn't know if someone was just beyond injury at this juncture because it's something that has plagued them so much. But um, it's too bad. They were kind of my, I was looking to them now. It looked like it was going to be an interesting kind of uh, competitive rivalry between uh, Moore Towers and Marinaro and Sigan and Bilodeau, and they both traded Montreal, and I believe Bruno was working with both of them, uh, you know, only, you know, consulting really with Sigan and Bilodeau, but working, you know, with Moore Towers and Marinaro, and, you know, kind of a nice push for Canada that's now gone. You know, Canada went from having four teams competing for three spots, they only have one real top pair at this point in time. Um, which is going to be interesting, uh, where, uh, you know, because they had so much depth in the pairs. You know how much I love Kirsten. Yeah. But I do think, like, a team like Julianne and Charlie showed infinitely more depth and potential, big picture, than I believe that Kirsten um, and Michael have. To me, even though they may have not delivered on a consistent level or have been the consistent number two in Canada, to me, the raw talent of a Julianne and Charlie, I much prefer, actually, which is why I'm, I I hope maybe I guess that they both continue and, and find something, but as we know with Kirsten and Dylan, like, I'm, I'm afraid it's a Kirsten-Dylan situation. I don't know. I don't know who else is available in Canada at this point. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So right. usually when someone ends it like that, unless it was some argument that happened where, you know, words are said that you can't take back, I, uh... I don't know if, you know, he has an idea about what he wants to do, but obviously right. these things take time. So it's it's really unfortunate. The timing is odd. It seemed like um, a knee-jerk response to something, because otherwise you would have thought it would just have happened at the end of last season. Because, I mean, already in, like, late July, mid-July, whatever it is, like, so much time has been lost if, if indeed, you were going to try to seek someone new. But. but I also think this is the time when especially after the Olympics, which are so draining and exhausting that now you're getting really back into training and kind of the psychological and physical torture of getting yourself back, uh, you know, into, you know, preparing to compete and go out there. And I think that that's um, maybe why things, you know, happened the way they did. I know that they did have programs and they had worked with, they were working with Marie France on free skate and they were doing different things and apparently had a good free skate that was, you know. And all that money. I mean, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not like a choreographer doesn't get paid just because you're not going to use it. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and I'm sure they got a lot of money from Canada, all these sorts of things. Like, it couldn't have been a rash decision, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, but I was, I was disappointed by that. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they, I hope they made the right decision for them. <laughs> just as, like, a fan, I was like, oh, that's too bad because I enjoyed watching. And then um, Minura and, and Ga Alexander Gamble, and they split... Uh, the ice dancer team. Uh, so that was also kind of interesting when uh, that was a split. You talk about money. There was a GoFundMe account. I guess the Korean fans donated like, I don't know the exact figure, but a su substantial amount of money. And then they split. And I guess, where does that money go? Does it go back? And Yeah. 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 Damage desperation or something. Yeah. But I, I think that they are, I think that they're done perhaps both done uh, competing, so I'm not sure uh, there, but that was kind of thing. But I thought it was interesting. Um, there's been a lot about Gracie, you know, it's been trickling out. She did work with uh, Jeremy Abbott on both programs. Apparently, she, they did a short, to, I'm going to put a spell on you. Um, you don't know what the free skate is. They were working on her program with uh, wireless earbuds on the other day in there. I don't think that... I think because she's trying to get back into... Um, competitive form, you know, and do this comeback and relearn jumps. I know that someone had said that she was doing her triple-triple, um, and that report wasn't quite true. I mean, she's been working triple lots and triple flip, but also working the triples on the harness, so it's not as far along, I think, as perhaps it was tweeted about. It would be non-sustainable and completely non-functional to think that it would be. <laughs> like... This is a real thing. It's going to take a long time. And I'm sure, I don't know if having something on the books helps motivate her, but it is like, I, 
given the minefield that this must be for her, I hope she didn't set an unattainable goal, not that she couldn't come back, but that in the time expected, like, did you put that on the books so you're actually ready by nationals? Or did you actually put this on the books so you're actually ready by the next year's Grand Prix? You know, this takes time to do this. So uh, you yeah. must figure skating is involved with this. And what I think is so strange is that she was, it went from being that they were going to help her come back to that they were going to make sure she got a Grand Prix to they were going to make sure she got a Grand Prix. And as long as she's in suitable form, she'll get Skate America too, you know, and how those TBDs are negotiated. And you think like, okay, she's just getting back her triples. She, it doesn't seem like she'll have time to really do summer competitions and then you're going to put her on the Grand Prix, and it seems like a, a recipe for... It doesn't have to do with Gracie or her ability. ability. No one This is about that. timing and, and preparation. Uh, and I would almost give her a special lifetime free pass to Nationals and just say, look... Just do the work. Just do the work at your own pace and just do it slowly and do it right. I mean, the worst thing to do with top eight, top six, yeah, like... It would be just unfortunate if, given the mental um, minefield that this sport may still be, uh, for someone who's been through a lot of things like that, um, the worst thing to do would be to keep identifying competition with negative experiences. Like, if she does take the Grand Prix and it does not go well, oh, now... Then, then we're left with the why am I even trying... Why am I even trying this comeback kind of thing? I wouldn't want it to be like a Paulina Edmonds situation. And you know that, like, I am, like, a sentimental man of Paulina's, but, like, we knew at some, at a certain point, you were like, I just don't see how this schedule is possible. And inevitably, regardless of her ability or whatever, this schedule wasn't possible. So I, I would, and now, now I'm assuming she's done forever. I wouldn't want that to happen to Gracie is if like maybe she could mentally make a comeback, but then by trying to do it too soon, it dissuaded her from trying again. Yeah. yeah. It seems like a weird transient time too. So I went to the Terra Maudlin Ice Dreams event at uh, Westchester oh, Skiing. Dreams. Dreamy ice, ice on dreams, dream fantasy, skate my dreams, dream into skate. Like. <laughs> but it was interesting because it was, you know, basically um, there are not many you know, shows, uh, anything for skaters to do. So it's a really interesting time. And um, basically it, it, it formats that there's a camp uh, and they, with coaches and they bring in the skaters who are going to do the show and at different points, I think each skater perhaps does a seminar and does a Q&A with the kids. So Mariah was there, Karen Chen, Jeremy Roheen, um, Star Andrews, which is weird that these kids are kind of teaching the seminars, but I think they were brought in more as the skater for the day. Uh, Star Andrews and Alyssa Liu. So it was really interesting to kind of look at uh, what the situation is with all of them. Karen, um, there's been word that she's been injured. Um, Tammy is with Tom Z. Currently working together. No one really knows or believes how this is going to last or work out. But Karen did not look... Competitive, um, ready. No, like she looked like I thought that her musicality had improved and stuff with with Stars and Ice, and I thought that that was you know one thing. But I, she looked not psychologically ready for the season. You know, like she looked like I think that she had to leave because she was going to go take the ACTs the next day. So you have to think that she's thinking about college. You know, there's just a lot going on in her life, and the post. You know, who knows? Is she going to do another Olympics? Is she going to do another? See, I think these skaters don't know. I think that's kind of the. Important and that shows, yeah, that, that indecision, yeah. I, I didn't feel like she looked quite ready for the Grand Prix. Perhaps there is time, but she's another one like Dennis with the foot problems, with the... I think there's a lot going on there, too. Except for me, the payoff of Karen is nowhere near what the payoff of Dennis was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I think she's been working with Arasha. People don't know if that's a summer thing. If she's going to go back to Tammy, uh, you know, I think it's all unclear because she's also been, you know, spending time in Canton, I guess, with perhaps with Marina, perhaps, you know, just getting at that rink. So I don't really know what um, the situation is, but 
it, almost seems unfocused, or some, or um, like it has a, she has like attention deficit training disorder, or something like that's a bit scattered and unclear. It's the ones that really have that tunnel vision for whatever their goal is, and I'm sure if you don't really know what the goal is, it's hard to stay motivated. I don't see why she would go back to Tammy other than the fact that that's who she's been with, but I think you kind of get the same result. So I think there's no point. She's been to the Olympics. She's been national champion, but it hasn't gone well. She hasn't had a clean, consistent triple-triple with technique that has worked for her. So I don't see why you would keep doing the same thing because you just keep getting that same triple-triple. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that, I think working perhaps with, Russia with Marina with Oleg maybe that would help her and different off ice and I, I really see no purpose in going back to Tammy and doing that unless she wants to move to Colorado and try you know the Olympic Training Center and yeah, yeah, come okay. see but I know I don't know I kind of feel like that's not the best choice for her at this time yeah, yeah, I think it would be interesting to see what happens if she got really physically buff from working with Alex and what kind of yeah, confidence yeah. that could give her. Um, it's interesting. I feel like U.S. figure skating is rushing Alyssa Liu already. You know, like we've seen them do it with Gracie. And with, so, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of focus on her. And perhaps, you know, with Michelle, there was a lot of focus early on with Michelle Kwan and they kind of navigated. But I... I think my concern with her is that there's so much talk about this triple axle. So she did it, and the show was completely cheated. Um, her triples were under-rotated um, there, like noticeably so. And she also needs to work a lot on the skating skills. There is inherent ability there. Like, there's an inherent ingredients to a top skater. But there's a lot that needs work. And But at the same time, they're pushing her senior this year. Um, they're pushing her, um, she's going to international in Asia again, and it's, it's a little bit confusing. She's going to champs camp and it seems like they need to be working on the fundamentals now so that it will pay off later. But well, so this is the, this is the thing. It's like, <clears throat> to me, again, like people that are putting all their eggs in like a crazy basket or so worried about Kieran, like in many ways, uh, as if you were in the position of the Federation, the ship has sailed there, right? Like, it's about the investment in, in the new skaters and the younger skaters, the up-and-coming skaters. So how does one facilitate that properly? When you have a talent like Ms. Yu, like, how are you going to do it? Uh, is it? Is it, would you keep her and build her as a junior in confidence, or do you push her into senior and start getting her going out there? Do you say, like, yeah, train the heck out of the triple axel because we know those that have successfully done it did do it so early on. Maybe we'll have to leave it and then come back to it. Um, it's just a matter of what is the right balance of pushing and holding and what is the right balance of taking risks but staying at home and working on basics. I don't know. Because she can't compete against the other juniors, you almost want to just say work on your skating skills and your jump technique and your choreography and your musicality for like 16 months and then go out there and wow everyone. I mean, it really seems like this is the time where she needs to work on all of that development, you know, and like in a crash because she's too young to go out, you know. Are we only talking about her because of that triple axle? Well, last year she won junior nationals with triple triples, and I think there was like, wow, you know, and she went out with a dress that was reminiscent of a Sasha dress. It's clearly that there's been like a, a lot of attention. Her dad it seems very intelligent, uh, but it seems like there's also a pushing and perhaps. I was wondering in opera, like, what age does like a young soprano who's a virtuoso, like, at what point do they start peaking and hitting? Like, what age would they hit the stage? <laughs> than you think, which is why all this, like, childhood opera thing is kind of nonsense. It's so different than skating. Yeah, you, you're going to hit your prime in your 40s for a lot of these people. So 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 much is done too soon, and, like, so there's these, like, Jackie Evanko, Wunder, Kins, so it doesn't Charlotte have to church. What is that situation like? So Charlotte Church was a talented singer from the UK. Yeah, she was, like, a kid trick singer, and it was, like, fine, but, of course, it doesn't materialize into anything because it's not... For singing, particularly because of the muscle, like it doesn't, it's not ready. It, 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 that's not a thing. Or using a microphone for opera, like that's not opera anymore. <laughs> like, 
So it's totally that, different, but... Is that, like, the opera equivalent of, like, an Atari skater who gets a triple-triple and crashes and burns and goes through puberty and then you never see them again? Like, is that kind of the opera? Oh, no, the equivalent would be... Because Jackie Ovenko, in the talent scheme of things, would never have been able to do what those young Atari girls can do. It would be like if Jackie Ovenko was a skater and she did shows in a harness, but they kept the, the harness part out of sight. <laughs> so she would do an under-rotated triple-toe loop and everyone would be excited. That's 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 the Charlotte Church equivalent. <laughs> there's a, you know, the equivalents run all over the place. Like it's so <laughs> every person in each world has their you know operatic or figure skating equivalent. So, so Mariah also did a program. Okay. Now Mariah physically was skating with a lot of speed and um, but she always does in her exhibitions. She looks happy. Uh, it looked like the pressure is off, but then there's some speculation that she may show up at nationals. She's still been working with Tom. Who knows? Um, she looks incredible. She looks like she's um, in brand three shape. Yes, I mean she wasn't doing triple triples or triple axel, but her okay. jumps by themselves look really good, and she was wow. skating with a lot more like freedom and movement, and just you know, like you saw some of like the old Mariah that you saw. But she was skating to, like, one of the songs from Wicked, either No One Mourns the Wicked or No Good Deed Goes Unpunished, or one of those just... Well, just well, like, deep numbers. Okay. Kind of, but it, like, also had all of the production noise in the background, and it just sounded like a lot of noise in the arena. It took a minute to be like, what is this? Complete cluster F of a program. But, like, great talent, and she did three triples, and looked the best. Star Andrews was, um, we talk about a novelty act. When she's not doing Whitney Houston or doing, um, whip, whip, it. whip you know, with my hair back and forth, she, so they, they gave her summertime. Such an eye roll, Jonathan. Like, I mean, for someone who really, there just seems to not be a lot of guidance. Okay. And there's not yep. a lot of, um, skating ability to, go back to at the end of the day there. You know, the knee bend and the speed are not Summer, good. Well, summertime, it should be like a lush, deep edge skating. And her strength is in pizzazz, like X Factor Flash, not necessarily. Like, I'd actually rather see Jeremy yeah. or or Patrick or somebody skate to, to summertime on like a big, deep edge, you know. Yeah, Jeremy's is doing more and more his more like experiment. The one where he has the bell bottoms and the salmon the shirt. Yeah. The salmon <laughs> shirt, you know? Yeah. yeah. It was, but he looked incredible as Jeremy. Uh, right. So I, I think Alyssa said, you know, yeah, Jeremy didn't have a lot of shows for a while and he wasn't skating so well. And then he had shows come up on the horizon and like, bam, he's doing his triples again. Like, can pull himself together. You talk about but the talent. He had a Japan Open, right? That he's usually a favorite there, even though obviously he's retired. But yeah, Japan Open, Shizuka shows. He's got a bunch of stuff on the horizon. So and he's helping Gracie. I think he's another talent where there are a lot of just talents. I think in the U.S. that have stuff like that have they have merit, but there's nowhere to put them. Like where. You kind of see, like, oh. Ashley Wagner, like, she's with her cat and talking about podcasting, but doesn't... They all seem like they don't fully know what they're going to do. But there's a lot of talent there. I think there's something... Maybe Tara Maudlin can take um, Lipnitskaya and Ilyinik and Ashley and Jeremy and get backers and put a production together, you know, and... Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, because, like you say, there's a... These skaters fall into this void... Mm -hmm. there's too much talent just sitting around looking for something to do and, and you see them all kind of try to find it in different ways because again as we mentioned like just those like hokey shows like I, I, I love skating but I'm probably not going to like XYZ retired skater and friends evening in spotlights and jeans and colored shirts you know what I mean like but there's something pro-am competitions I don't know there's Something I'd still love to see them do. Well, would you see Liza at a jazz club? Would you be like, oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying, they need to. They need to do that. Like they need to have the um, jazz club equivalent of skating, where you see yeah, someone like an after-hours cabaret, but it's just like 
Ashley Wagner sitting on a stool with a cigarette, reminiscing, tells a story, skates a program. <laughs> like, do a show in Vegas and get Bobek out there with the blonde hair and the glitter and like the. She come down from one of those circus rings. <laughs> in a long dress like the Supremes and come out there. And then um, maybe, maybe like Oksana Bayul and and Nicole Bobek or like Pasha and Nicole Bobek can come out and they can do like the um, the Chicago number, you know? Well, he had it coming. <laughs> the cell block tango or something with all of them and I think there's so many neat, like those old Sandra Bedja, like, um, I said it like I was checking, uh, the Sandra Bessick programs, like the Carmen Ice, like the, I just don't see stuff like that anymore. Look, there needs but. to be a, a Vegas kind of show where the, you can have a couple martinis and see these old showgirls go out there and... And I want them to have a microphone. I want them to tell them, like, tales out of school <laughs> in between the numbers. I want to do, like, an actual evening with Ashley Wagner. Not where we sit and watch program after program, but, like, something that's intimate and you feel like you're getting to know the person. I'm here for it. I would buy that ticket. There's something there, okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. We, we can look at Dennis Ten's photographs and have a skater play the piano and then, you know... Their favorite stories. Yeah, exactly. I love I love that kind of side of things, and, and I wish that there was more of a, a medium for them. Yeah. And you know how I said my horror was, you know how we had we had that discussion about The Greatest Showman being just our, our, our nightmare. It is. You know, Tara Modlin's a patriotic girl, and she's real. She was, to me, she was an ice dancer, but, who, but she was really, um, I think she was meant to be musical theater in, in many ways. Mm. So, of course... Well, like that early 90s kind of ice dance that were basically was. <laughs> yes. Beverly so, Smith said the music did everything but oink back then. <laughs> yeah. And even then it probably did. Yeah, okay. So The Greatest Showman, this is, that was definitely part of a group number. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. As were the Black Eyed Peas. You know. Dated, dated, but... They think they're being well, she's Jewish, so the Mazel Tov had to come in there. You know, that, yeah. that's yeah. it. Um, yeah. And then, of course, um, everyone's grown. We are the champions at the end of the group number. I was saying, you know, we need to... You know what musical is making a comeback, Dave? What? Anastasia. And I'm like, Terrell Pinsky, Terrell Pinsky. Ah! <laughs> Yeah, Broadway yeah. has really gone to shit. I mean, we thought that the jukebox musicals were just the beginning. Now we have Frozen, we have Harry Potter, we yeah. have Anastasia. We're old, old animated films from 98 Olympic upsets. Like, we're just bringing them all back out of the woodwork. Phantom of the Opera <laughs> is still there. Yeah, yeah, probably. They're making a movie of cats. I They're making a movie of king cats. I and know. they have Taylor Swift because she's such a cat person. But it gives Jennifer Hudson something to do because we haven't figured out. Her, where to put singing, her singing memory will probably be great, but can't she just do that on a telethon or something? <laughs> she really is the kind of skater, the kind of singer. Sorry, um, <laughs> she is perfect for um, the Whitney Houston tribute, the Michael Jackson tribute. We haven't figured out where else to put her, so this right. is. Um, She's like a retired great skater. We if just have could, to wear her. <laughs> if she could skate, we'd have her do the Dennis. 10 tribute, like Miguel did on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, Absolutely. Yeah, there's just... The Cats film, though. When I saw that, I, this is not real life. You know it's going to be panned, like Mamma Mia 2. You know it's going to be just terrible. You know what? You know, I'm going to say our boyfriend, Jim Peterson, and he's probably going to get one of his kids stage with it. You know he loved The Greatest Showman. Thank God Gianna went to Marie France, but I have to say, so... There's a rumor strong rumor that there's going to be a, a program to the bodyguard not to I will always love you but to I have nothing and Jonathan made the shadiest um oh, hey, all right Dave <laughs> comment that <laughs> I have that other Jonathan guy you know <laughs> that I've still been laughing about all week because I went to see the Whitney documentary go see it if you okay. haven't um but Jonathan goes Deanna shouldn't be skating to anything that reminds her of her prom. <laughs> that they played at her prom. Oh, my goodness, Jonathan. Oh, you know, it was at my prom, too. I don't know why I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe they're going to like that it's like, oh, this is a different era. Like, her skating. Like, it's six, this 6.0 music. 
Yes. With beautiful 6.0 skating. I love a that. funnier comment that I heard about that, and this comes from an anonymous person in skating, said, I said, is there going to be, because I, when I heard it was the bodyguard, I said, well, is it going to be on the big note? Is that where the big throw is going to be? And he said, well, the person said, well, it's, I have nothing. And it is going, there is something on the big note that you know all of the gays and Star Andrews' mother will love. And I said, that is amazing. That's um, great, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe Sean Eckhart can make an appearance. <laughs> 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 It's true. Oh, wait, wait, are you serious? serious? Yeah, isn't that the member, the one that said he did international espionage? I believe yeah, that guy. Oh, oh, dang, I didn't know that he had passed. I believe he did. Okay, Christine, I believe that that man has passed. I hey, believe, I, well, I think the steroid guy, the one that was like the steroid kind of, and he was in the E! True Hollywood story, I think he's still with us. I don't know what happened to... Um, right now. I don't know what happened to the driver, but I do believe... I believe the one whose parents taped over his Star Trek collection. I believe that one. Well, let's see. Sean Eckhart by... Well, uh, we don't have to figure this out now. I thought he was still alive. I can just dead. That is literally the first sentence in this article. What? Where are they now? It says Eckhart is dead. Okay. Gosh, well, John, yeah. how dare you? I know. Okay. God, Sandra wow. Licklow would be able to tell you. Okay, I got invited to that uh, premiere of the Tanya film documentary. I asked Jeeves if Sean Eckhart is alive, and it says Eckhart is dead. He died in 2007 of natural causes. So. Do you have Tanya Harding for tea? Because I was. There were, I got invites for that uh, documentary that was originally on Tanya in the 80s, and I thought, I am so sick of Tanya Harding and this story at this point. I, I No, because you know what I want, Dave? I want someone to come out, like, with the, with the Tanya interviews that I want to see, which is her actually talking about her technique, which is her actually talking about how she gained speed when she changed spin positions, and then to be like, well, to ask the questions about, like, jet lag. Like, I want, like, no one will actually talk about, like, the insider skating nerd stuff with her. I want to talk to her about what she felt about figures. Well, she's on Instagram. Send her a message, okay? You can feel Tanya Harding. You know the show must have made her do that. But there's a part of Tanya we're denied access to. Do you know what I mean? Like, when you have had, like, some of these, like, great skaters come on and they, like, open up about their choreographic, like, process. <laughs> Tanya talking about that. <laughs> or, you know, figures and this kind of stuff. Like, again, I feel like we're just denied access to all of that information because it's just like a, did you know? Did you know? Ugh, enough. We have enough of those interviews. I want to know about the Axel check. You ever notice that she cries in the same point of telling the story about the triple Axel every time? She's still a performer. She knows when to bring the tears when talking about 91 Nationals. Well, even, even that, like, uh, let's talk about beyond 91 Minneapolis. You know what I mean? Like, it's, um, I'm just, I'm ready for the new stories because oh, I'm up all the other ones. Yeah. How did you want to skate to people are still having sex? Whose idea was that? That would be the interesting. <laughs> you know, after that, like, after the movie came back and I remembered that that was the name of that song, I, of course I looked it up on, like, Apple Music and, like, played it for a day and I was like, there's, like, a whole other section she definitely should have used. Feel free to listen to that song it's in, in its entirety. <laughs> Maybe she can bring it back as a show number for our non-existent show in the mall she, in Portland. She would be great in the Vegas. Tanya with Bobek and Pasha. We could have uh, Ayul uh, come out. Come on. Ashley could introduce them. The we, backstage antics, we'd have to have a camera back there for sure. Come on. The um, reality show going The on. bad girls of skating like Cabaret yeah. Night. Come on, this would be a great show. Yeah. Maybe Rudy Galindo could be the MC and could be the warm up with the YMCA with the audience. Come That's on. Right. That's right. Who else do you want to see in this number? Um, well, who else would do it? You know what I mean? You know Michelle's not doing it. But. Yeah, I know. But they would they would secretly want to come and, and have a couple of cocktails. Oh, you might be in the front row, but not admit. Yeah, I agree 100%. Everyone would say, oh, I would never go and support them. They were criminals. And then we could, yeah. yeah. Exactly. 
nonsense. <laughs> nonsense, okay? They're entertainers, through and through. <laughs> and everyone needs to be in Jeff Billings' original sparkles, okay? Yeah. We need them at their Olympic weight. Nicole Bobek <laughs> doing that, um, doing her spiral. No, no real jumps needed, I think. The jump kick into a double flip, yeah. Yes, but just the fan spiral. We could have Sasha Cohen uh, come out if she's... And maybe Dick Button can live tweet yes. for, for, for live commentary. Yeah. Because he's got some gems in there. My favorite was when he looked at Nicole's Avita program. I think it was the Avita program. And he's like, you know, this looks like it was just slapped together with some scotch tape and skated poorly. Or whatever the exact quote was. was I'm amazing. trying to work on a, I thought since his birthday, I'm trying to work on a Dick Button montage. Because there is one on... The gold standard, is that what it's yes, called? Yes, but I feel like there should be a Dave and Jonathan one of our... Um, you know, your famous um, Angelina Nikodinov, this is a good time for a refrigerator break comment. That needs to be in one. Yes. No and of course, like for his birthday, I left that out. It was, you know, skating fans think it's funny when it's not Americans that he's talking about. So when it's, when it's the bad um, layback right. that the random Chinese girl does, that's funny. Um, Check that out, my dear. Yeah. <laughs> Because someone said to me, why didn't you post the Angela clip? And I'm like, because Angela had a mother who passed away. And they will say that it's picking on someone who is... Um, it seems crueler somehow. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. we need the clip. And if someone has this that can get this to us, because it's not on YouTube, we need the Midori Ito with the Dick and Peggy commentary because it's only up from 96 Worlds with... The awful Peter Carruthers ESPN. I don't know why. Hey, hey, so when we literally cleaned out like my family home, I think I found my '96 World VHS. You should have said something. I would have taken so it. Anyone has said. it and can upload it to YouTube in some way. This is needed for a montage. My friend Triple XL. He doesn't have it. I messaged Sklar. This is me. Okay. And you know what? Sklar is a gem to the skating community because. His YouTube channel was taken down so many times during their, or their early YouTube days when they would hear a song and like delete people's accounts. Right. Now you just don't get monetized for that. But he re-uploaded his collection countless times. It's, it's for real, I, I think, a jewel. And, and literally anything. That weird 1993 Hershey Pro-Am, blah, blah, blah. Boom, it's there in its entirety. Hyacinth B also doesn't have it up yet. But you can't message people on YouTube anymore. And I thought... I want to know, who, who is Hyacinth? Does Hyacinth watch the skating lesson? Because you're one of my favorite people, and I don't know who you are or your name. I, think, I don't know this. This is a YouTube channel you're talking about? Oh, yes. They upload the competition in full. Yeah, you can see the fluff pieces, the whole deal. If you oh, want to yeah, really watch that's... that 93 Hershey's... Whatever it was. Yes. <laughs> when I'm with Lisa Urban. Um, I had that Sun Valley Idaho competition on VHS too. It's too bad. Again, I wish I wish I had known about the 96 one because it was literally like me and those girly bubble letters I wrote. And it was like, 96 world. That is one of my favorite events to watch like after you take the melatonin at night when you only have 10 minutes left of consciousness and you're right. running out. And you don't need to closely pay attention because you know exactly what's happening on the screen. You yeah. can watch Bobak and Nicole and um, Lisa Irvin. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, the yes. Game. The whole gang was there. It's a great one to watch. Remember, after the melatonin, when it's kicking in, you know, after your evening shower, when you're just about to pat, that's the... That game. melatonin, I usually have about a five-minute window before when I take it, when I fall asleep, and I'm very mean in the middle. Oh, no. It, no so so I, I actually stopped taking it. So I'd be yelling at Screen. I'm, like, That's <laughs> I'm telling you, what do you watch before the melatonin kicks in? But um, yes, <laughs> comment below, hold an edge, and look sexy. Bye.